keep joining. Oh. Yeah. Better to start. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. Perfect timing. <laughs> okay. So welcome everyone and uh, welcome you to this second part of this online piece of lectures uh, for basics on gravity after the summer break, we start again. And we start again with John Donoghue, that was going to also have, um, we also will discuss the second part of his mini course. In the first part, which you can find on our website as well as on his personal website, and you'll find all the links uh, on the basic of quantum gravity webpage. Uh, he discussed general relativity as a quantum theory. And uh, in the second half, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess you'll discuss a little bit about effective theory in general That's and then right. apply to yeah, things you've done in the first part. So right. whenever you're ready. So let me start sh screen sharing and then we'll. Yeah. Okay, so yes, um, in the first part, the goal was to do a quantum field theoretic construction of, of general relativity. We didn't use the phrase manifolds. We talked about symmetries and path integrals and the like. Um, and it does fit very nicely into the quantum field theory framework. Our task now is to do some calculations We'll look a little bit at what happens in the UV, but in the end, you have to transition to the infrared, to low energy where the theory makes sense. And so today we start doing some calculations, trees and loops, we'll do loops today. Uh, Wednesday is devoted to effective field theory in general. And then Friday is using effective field theory techniques and perturbative quantum gravity. We'll do some low energy theorem. So you can make rigorous predictions in quantum general relativity at low energies, but then there are also limitations. And so the goal is to, con to describe both of those. So just a bit of a review. Um, we started off doing covariant path integral quantization. Covariance is important because you need to respect the symmetries of the theory. Um, path integrals is the way we quantize all our modern theories. And it's, it's somewhat fashionable to ask the question whether or not gravity should be quantized. But in some sense, the answer is already contained here. You we write the matter fields using a path integral. That's how we quantize them. G has to appear in that uh, expression, but it also has to appear in the, in the path integral. Because the way you get out interactions between these matter fields, gravitational interactions, requires the graviton propagator. And to get the graviton propagator, you need to integrate over the, the, the metric degrees of freedom. Now there's no sense that the statement is that, the, that this is true at all energies, but it has to be true at low energies where we've, we've seen these interactions. And so, this is a one way of saying the statement that gravity must be quantized. We treat this perturbatively because in the real world, the gravitational fields are weak. So we imagine a background metric and, and a quantum fluctuation, which is quantum. We like all our like all gauge theories, we need gauge fixing. And in this case, I've used the harmonic gauge that leads to some ghost fields, and you get out of Feynman rules. So the as I said, one of the first things you get out is the propagator. The propagator is a massless field with the usual I epsilon and then some tensor structure. Um Previously, I gave this in d is equal to four. 
here it is in, in a general deep because we're going to use dimensional regularization. That difference doesn't make much difference for anything that I'm talking about here. I, it doesn't make any, it, the divergence structure isn't changed. The, the infrared limits have not changed, but nevertheless, that's the correct result. There are matter Feynman rules. There are also ones that look like, like that, or th there can be arbitrary many gravitons emitted from the vertex. There are ghost fields, and then the graviton itself interactions themselves and, and messier ones, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's sort of a lightning summary of what we accomplished in the past. The, the thing I'd first like to talk about here is the free graviton field and some of its matrix elements. <clears throat> okay, so the idea here is that you can second quantize gravitational waves just like you do um, you do for phonons. You take classical sound waves and you describe the quanta by doing second quantization. And in this case, we're, we're doing around flat space. So we're gonna do weak field around flat. We'll define the path integral, the gauge fixing. So we'll do G mu nu is eta mu nu plus kappa h mu nu. The gauge fixing is going to be d mu h mu nu minus one half d nu h lambda lambda equals zero. So that's weak field limit of it. And we saw previously that the wave equation then comes out, Einstein's equation comes out to be box h mu nu in the vacuum equals to zero. So it's a massless wave. And we can describe the physical states. So again, this is what we what's done right there is the equivalent of what you could do classically. So physical states, there's two propagating polarizations. The, so you, you know this um, for two reasons. One is just, is the Lorentz group that tells us that that massless spin two fields have um, polarizations or helicities plus and minus two, and we also know it from classical gravitational waves. Um, the easiest way for us to describe that is po with polarization vectors. And so let's, let me just do photon polarization vectors first. So <clears throat> photons come with helicity lambda is plus and minus one. They are described by a, a vector field, which can we can use um, if we're using the momentum is it in the z direction. So massless field moving in the z direction the polarization vector be zero, one, plus or minus i. 
zero satisfies Q mu epsilon mu equals zero and epsilon star lambda epsilon lambda is one, so it's normalized. That's a convention, but that's and an epsilon mu lambda epsilon mu lambda without the star is equal to zero and is equal to epsilon star minus lambda epsilon of lambda. So there's orthogonality relations also. Okay. For gravity, you can do the same sort of thing. We would have waves epsilon mu nu e to the i q dot x. And if that's going to be spin two h lambda lambda is a should be equal to zero because this is a Lorentz scalar. So that you expect epsilon lambda lambda equals to zero. And harmonic gauge um, is Q mu epsilon mu nu equals zero then. And so if you look back at the gauge condition, the gauge condition that guy was a scalar, this one is then set equal to zero, we're satisfied. And so we can use, we can use the spin one to construct it. You can use epsilon mu nu lambda g graviton being plus or minus two, equals epsilon mu of the photon plus or minus one, epsilon mu plus or minus one, epsilon nu, sorry. So you basically take the product and then the orthogonality relations make the trace zero and the gauge conditions make the, the, the photon gauge condition makes the harmonic gauge condition work. So with this, we can do the decomposition H mu nu of X T is sum over lambda is plus plus or minus minus the integral D three Q two pi cubed one over square root of two omega Q. I'm just repeating what you do for phot phon photons. A, a creation operator for Q and lambda, epsilon mu nu, Q and lambda, e to the minus Q dot X, plus emission conjugate. Okay, so that's that's a construction. Let's see that it makes sense by looking at the energy in the, that's carried by this. Okay, so we can look at the energy by, by doing the following construction. We have, in general, G mu nu, is eight pi g t mu nu. And we can expand g mu nu is, I'm sorry, in powers of h.
of the field. And then you can arrive, you arrive at box H mu nu. Oh, actually, I, I need a step. Sorry. Excuse me. Let me say something first. If we define, I'm going to define something. P mu nu is going to be defined as one over eight pi g. The second order piece here, which I'll display for you in just a minute. Then you get box h mu nu is eight pi g t mu nu plus t mu nu. Um, okay, so that in this framing, it looks like this t mu nu is, is energy and momentum. So let me just show you what that looks like. I'll just copy it from here. This guy looks like the following. Um, actually, I see a typo there. Let's and if you see the typo there, that's D new H. Um, and H here is H is. H lambda lambda. Um, some of the things you can see about this is well, it has two derivatives. That's typical of energies for boson fields. The last three lines are total derivatives. They have derivatives sitting outside here. So this has been rearranged a bit for, to make this work. These are total derivatives. So they don't contribute to the integrated energy. These guys, these next two here, vanish by the equations of motion. And so this messy looking thing is really just, in practice, on shell is just the first line. And even there, the h, the h lambda lambda piece drops out. And so it's really just that first term is the energy momentum if you're trying to use it. So now we would then then try. So this this could have been all done at this stage classically if we want to do second quantization. We would try a of p and lambda a dagger commuted with a p prime lambda prime is delta lambda lambda prime, the delta three of p minus p prime. And if you do that, you find that the Hamiltonian defined as the integral d3x over t zero zero, this this so called energy term ends up being just the the usual energy. It's the sum over lambdas integral d three p two pi cubed omega of q a dagger of q lambda a of q lambda plus a half. So you get the usual quantization and then you get energy eigenstates.
Okay, so this again behaves just like the standard quantization rules. We we've defined our, our graviton states here. There's a piece of lore that I'd like to say at this stage, um, which I won't prove, but there's a construction due to Desser, Stanley Desser. By basically continuing this procedure, so basically he considered massless spin two, coupled up to energy, and so basically he starts where we did we the free field. Then give the team you need. The um, if you then iterate this the free plus t one mu nu gives you a t two mu nu a second order, and you just keep iterating this, and you get gr. This seems to be correct, although there is a slight caveat that the, the you can also get what's called unimodular gravity. But basically, the piece of lore that you it's worth keeping in your mind is that the gravitational interactions are just self-consistent massless spin two coupled up to energy. Okay. Any questions at this stage? Just let's Yeah, the, I see there's a question in the chat. Uh, I don't know okay. if I'm able to, to read it. <laughs> if, um let's see I'm I don't think I can read it easily. Could someone read it to me? Yeah, so there's a question by Faisal and said, uh, should the graviton state constructed from photon ones be a superposition? For example, for zero, uh, it says minus one, one plus one minus one. Well, this is a formula, so I don't know if you understood the question. Um, As you said, you, you you said a product of it, probably Faisal. Yeah, so it's the, it's the product. It's not a, it's not, I'm just doing this as a, this is a, a, technical derivation of the spin two polarization vector. It's not saying that it's that it is exactly um two spin one fields. So that is about to be where I'm headed next. I'm going to talk about gravity as the square of a gauge theory next. Um but so in a sense we'll make that explicit what in what sense this actually works. Uh, but at this stage, at this stage, this is just a, a technical construction of the polarization vector for a spin two, massive spin two particle. Okay, is that sufficient? Yeah. All right. Okay. But I do want to take a detour into something that's that's really fascinating. Um, which is that the gravity, the massless tree level amplitudes, the gravitational tree level amplitudes are in some sense the square of gauge theory amplitudes. So at this stage in this, the development, of the topic as a whole. This is true of amplitudes. And for the most part, they refer to true amplitudes, although there are results for loop amplitudes also. Um, I have on the website papers by Zvi Baron 
and Lance Dixon. Um, and there's a longer review by Henriette Elvang and Wang, and a link to the book that they produced from that too. So this is much to much a topic for me to cover completely, but we really can't go without out, go without saying it. So because there's, there's many lessons here. One is is that on shell amplitudes are remarkably simple. Okay, so let's let's imagine taking um, graviton graviton scattering. Scatter. So there's a diagram that looks like this, a four point interaction that's too messy for me to even write down. There are then vertices that look like the triple graviton, one squared, crossed. And then there's, it goes like this, basically cross triples. And if you recall, the, these these are ex exceptionally messy. But on shell, these these all head up to something very simple on shell. The the scattering here, the gravitational scattering of one to three goes to four, so one two, three, four. Um, I'm going to write it down with particular helicities here is, well, the coupling sits out in front as cap over two, so we know it's cap over two squared. Um, in the usual Mendelstam variables, it's S cubed over TU. What was it? Um, here, let me, it's often written as cap over two squared S one two, S one two over S two three, S one two over S two four. Okay. In this notation here, Sij is Pi plus Pj squared. And here, this is Mandelstam. Um, but basically, this S12 is, is S, S23 is T, S24 is U. Um, so, you take that that whole bloody mess there, and it reduces to this relatively simple function. This works also for gauge series. If I do gauge in scattering, it's the same diagrams. It's not quite as messy, but um the amplitude for the gauge scattering one, two, three, four, same helicities minus minus plus is S12 over S. Um this one is two three. Okay. So just from these simple calculations, you realize that Feynman rules are correct, but clumsy.
I mean, I, I once tried to write out that graviton, graviton, myself and gave up after a while. And at some stage, that was a research project for a student. A student would publish, calculate that amplitude and publish a paper. It was first done by Cook. But even more amazing is that there is a general relation. And this is the amazing part, is that the tree gravitational amplitude, one, two, three, four, any polarizations is S12. The tree gauge, one, two, three, four, any polarizations, S tree gauge one two four three and there are generalized to higher ones to higher amplitudes so that if you know the gauge theory amplitudes you can write down the gravitational ones just by knowing these rules so this is the sense, and you, you can see it works out here. S1, 2 over 2, 3 is this one right there. The other one, S1, 4, 3 is the other one. Um, and then there's the S1, 2 factor out in front. So it's, it's not that they're exactly the square. There is a there is a kinematic factor out in front. But nevertheless, you know one, you know the others. And we, and in practice, now we know um, the the general rules for this. Um, this comes from it was originally found in string theory, but now it's it's just a gauge theory amplitude, KLT in strings. Which are basically closed loops and products of open loops. Open open strings are open, open strings, open strings are gauge fields, closed to gravitons, and so you can see how it could appear. Um, so how can it work? Well, it's still magic and I can't really tell you how it works completely, but you can see already that what we did before is useful. Epsilon mu nu, say plus plus is epsilon mu plus epsilon nu plus. So the, the spinners factorize much like the, 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 um, Re amplitude relations do. And you can sort of see that the the gauge amplitudes, which are some color factors times first factors of momentum, and the gravity ones also the equivalent ones are P, P, sorry, second order of P mu, nu, P, P nu. Um, there's two kinematic factors. So you can see that it has potential to work out. The spinners factorize, the momentums are come in the right ratios, but still is magic. So, and there is a three related theories. There's the gauge theories, where the amplitudes go like color factors times momentum. There's gravity theories, where amplitudes go like momentum. 
And then there's the a bia joint. Scalar, um, where it's a scalar field that goes like um, these. These are all end up being related. So again, I can't do too much here. I do want to just do one more thing in this topic, though. I want to talk about something that's simpler. I mean, th these ones are much too complicated to calculate directly if you want to check them. Here's one that I did when I wanted to check it. Um, and I'm going to use this later anyhow. So let's talk about it now. Compton amplitudes. So Compton means scattering of gravitons or photons off of matter. So we, when we do photon scattering, you might write out diagrams that look like this. That's for that's a spin zero particle, a spin a half as just the first two. And I I have this written out, but let's let me not write it out. There is there is however something to know about these is that there is a low low energy theorems. And this is not a typo, but it is a standard joke. The, the low, low energy theorems, the first law refers to Francis Low, a physicist. The second law refers to low energy. Um, but basically, Francis Low showed that the spin independent parts of these. Part, parts of these amplitudes are universal. And he also showed the linear also have a universality relationship. There's graviton Compton, which are spin zero. So these these in some sense are, are not that hard to calculate compared to other things that I've showed you there. Here there is one painful diagram, which is the one involving the graviton, but here these are also universal. I, I won't draw the others. They are also universal. Um, that was shown by Gross and Jakeev. But here again, there is this double copy relation that is, in this case, relatively simpler to check. If we have the amplitude for gravitational scattering of spin s is proportional to the amplitude for the photon scattering of spin zero times the amplitude for spin s for gravitational scattering. And then there are very there's a kinematic prefactor e one dot k one p two dot k two k one dot k two so there's kinematic factor 
And then you have to change the coupling constants around the product of those with photons goes like e to the fourth. And so you have to divide by e to the fourth. And there's factor of two and kappa over two squared. Okay, so simple relations between the gravitational and um, and uh, photon scattering amplitudes. So this is a a property that's that's a research area. It's still un, not completely understood, but it, these relations are just amazing. Okay. Again, stop for questions is appropriate here. Anybody? Yeah, there there are some questions in the chat. So, in the okay. <laughs> okay, we start on the first one. So, where do the fudge factors come from when we write gravity as a double copy of H theory? So the constants, basically. Where do the the constants come from? Um, well, I mean, originally they were found in. In, in the the string theory amplitudes, and so they're just um, the, there are rules for how you put them in. Uh, I have to refer to the other papers that I showed you for getting those rules. Um, but those rules are now at this stage known, and so you you don't need to go off and derive them yourself if you want the five particle scattering amplitude for gravitons, you can get it from the gauge theory ones in a known way. I mean, I can point out one of the kinematic factors here in this case here, this is sort of interesting in the sense that there is a this overall pole right there, one over Q squared. And that's this kinematic factor there, K dot, one dot K2, if this is one and that's two, K1 dot K2, 2K1 dot K2 is Q squared when they're on shell. And so it's not surprising to find that factor there. I don't know. I don't have much, too much else that I know how to tell you quickly about that. All right. So there's another question, probably always in relation to the amplitude, the gravitational amplitude in terms of gauge theory ones, or when you introduce Mandelson variables, if I'm not mistaken, which is does this contradict the Weinberg victim theorem? No. Um, uh, so weinberg witten theorem it says that that you can't build um, gauge amplitudes or gravitational amplitudes out of Lorentz invariant composite amplitudes for other fields. Um, and so um, it doesn't in the sense that both the photon and the, the graviton are not themselves Lorentz invariant quantities. This is always a tough one to explain, but the the photon amplitudes, the reason why Witten-Weinberg works is that the, the um, and the photon is not by itself a Lorentz invariant quantity. And the same is true of the graviton. And so the fact that they're both, they both are, have that property means it doesn't conflict Witten Weinberg. All right. Then I guess one last question before we continue. She's. Okay, could the gravity gauge square method be used to calculate amplitudes and modified theories of GR? And are there any constraints these modified theories must obey for it to hold? Yeah, so modified theories. Um, so one of the dangers of ma making modified theories is they violate some of these properties. Um, the Many of these properties can be de derived just by knowing the massless spin two nature of gravitons. Um, if you make a modified theory by adding extra scalars, then 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 no, this doesn't violate anything. Um, 
if you make make a modified theory by adding on locality, then then you have potential troubles with some of these relationships. Um, I don't think anybody has used these relations to calculate amplitudes in modified theories. Um, and it probably depends on the theory. Presumably when brands dicky type theories with an extra scalar, you could you could take advantage of this at some level. All right. So yeah, I guess we can proceed then. We'll, we'll postpone all the other questions for the end of the lecture. Okay. So if we're, we're set there, I want to spend the rest of the time today doing loops because there's where we get especially interesting. Um, let's first do loops of massless scalar fields. Because we know we have matter fields around and so let's, we won't start off doing graviton loops, we'll do, do matter loops first. And if you remember the the Feynman rule for this, the graviton coupling was cap over two P mu P prime nu P P prime plus P prime nu P mu minus eta mu nu P to P prime. So there was there was the, the Feynman rule. Okay, and so we're going to stick this into loops. The first thing you might try is there's a loop that looks like this, where there's a graviton and the scalar goes in a loop. This goes like integral d four k. Well, it's k mu k nu over k squared because it's a massless field. And even though that looks divergent, dimensional regularization, so let's do DD, sets this equal to zero. And the reason it sets it equal to zero is that there is no dimension full factor in here. So if this is this this integral overall carries dimensions, but there's no dimensional factor left over. So it can in some dimension it's defined and that in that dimension has to be zero because it can't be proportional to anything. So it's zero. So this is a typical property of dimensional regularization. Okay. If we then continue, we would perhaps draw diagrams that look like this. So two gravitons. This guy is also zero for exactly the same reason. This guy, the second guy here, looks like cap over two quantity squared, integral, well, let's, excuse me a second, mu to the four minus d, integral d dk, two pi to the fourth, K, K plus Q, K, K plus Q over K squared, K plus Q squared. Okay, so I'm suppressing all those indices. There's mu nu alpha beta. There's four indices on that. Um, but I'm looking primarily at the momentum factors. So now there is a factor, there's Q there, and this looks like overall, let's imagine D was close to four, 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 four in the numerator from the integral, four, eight, four more from the vertices. So this um, dimensionally then looks like 
mu to the four minus d times some energy to the d power. Well, there's four up there, there's four there, energy to the d. And this thing has to be q. This has to be some factors of q. That's the only factor around. And so we, we know that this amplitude mu nu alpha beta is, so it's order kappa squared. It's some tensor. Q squared squared. And then we know it's divergent also. You can see that from that. So in dimensional regularization, there's going to be a one over uh, d minus four because it's it's divergent as d goes to four. So this thing ends up looking like one over epsilon. Epsilon is d minus two over d minus four. And so this is this guy is tensor is dimensionless. So it looks like eta mu nu minus q mu q nu over q squared. There's two types of things like that. And I went by this a little quickly, but the q to the d over d minus four, there's also going to be a log q squared over mu squared. Um, that, that comes out of that. So the answer you can see is of order q to the fourth. And the, the point that I'd like to now, I'm pushing on, let's say it up front and then show you a bit, is that this is like a change in the Lagrangian that's of order the curvature squared. Okay, remember each curvature, so R itself, well, let's all write the exact one out. It's it's kappa eta mu nu box minus d mu d nu acting on H. Um, to first order, and then there's higher order terms. So this, when I take a matrix element, this turns into a factors of Q squared, like that, those tensors. So if one power of R goes like Q squared, two powers of R go like Q to the fourth, there's some dimensionless tensor, which is, you can sort of see coming out of that matrix element there. And, and so this, the result is like, some, some power of R, I'll write it as one over epsilon minus one box mu squared, R and you can de decompose it into and I shouldn't have written it quite like that that this matrix alma implies something that's like a change in the Lagrangian of order, like these terms. I'm going to defer log box, and maybe I'll get back to this later. But basically, matrix element of log box is meant to be log q squared. So the log q squares that come up there are, are like that. 
the explicit calculation gives A is um, 1 over 16 pi squared, 1 over 120, B is 1 over 16 pi squared, 1 over 240. That's probably irrelevant. But the, the main thing that I wanted to, that, that comes out of this is that is that you always get induced effects of order R squared. Okay, I, it doesn't matter too much what fields you use, it always has the structure. You get divergences that look like um, powers of the momentum, the the structure is like higher order Lagrangians of order the curvature squared. And so even if these divergences are, are wrong, let's let's imagine that there's something that makes these loops finite at high energies. Doesn't matter. The you'll still get effects of this order. Even finite effects of this order have to appear. Um, and so this is a, an important point here, is that independent of quantum gravity, just matter, quantum matter, means that there are effects of order, the curvature squared, induced by, by quantum loops. Okay, so that's, there's a lesson there. If you want to renormalize, So if you're doing a calculation and you want to renormalize these things, you would add to the Lagrangian terms that look like r mu nu, r mu nu, curvature squared terms, and then you can absorb these, the C1 renormalized is C1 bare, plus this a one over epsilon term and likewise C2. You can define renormalized fields. And then you'd go out and measure. Okay, it looks like there's a question or two. Uh, let's see, uh, I don't know. In the, in the chat, there are no new questions. Oh, okay. Okay, those are old ones. Yeah, probably, yeah. Very good. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Can Can I ask a question? Yes, I can hear you. Um, yeah. So I have actually two questions. The first one is um, in the in the process of renormalization, where the log box pieces goes into. Um, you need so the log box is not uh, is doesn't go into renormalization. It's a finite leftover effect. Okay. So you would in in practice then you would say the Lagrangian is C one. Some scale mu at some re renormalization scale. You measured at some renormalization scale. You would this would be non local, and I will talk about these non local stuff later. But that's it's a crucial point is, is the divergences are local, there are leftover effects that are not local. Um, let, let me just say one thing in, in, in case you need it. Look, the way you define log box is, is it, it, it's, this is not a delta function, it's the Fourier transform.
uh, for a transform of log Q squared. So if I'm going over to position space, the that Fourier transform you can calculate it is not local. It goes like it goes like one over x minus y to the fourth. So it's peaked at low energies, but at low distances. But okay, does that answer that part of the question? Yeah, thank you. Um, how how can you get that? x minus y to the minus four behavior? Like, do you make any approximation? Oh, I, 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 you, you get that just by doing dimensional analysis at this stage here. Um, the, uh, this is the dimension energy to the fourth log Q squared log is dimensionless. The only dimensional factor is x minus y. And so to get a, a dimension, energy to the fourth, you need x minus y, y to the fourth power. Okay, okay. Thank you. And if I can ask also another thing, can you go sure. up to the uh, second uh, diagram, like the, the loop? Yes. Why is the second diagram you've drawn, uh, is, why, why is that vanishing? Um, I'm not kind okay. of... So again, it's the argument that in that loop, there's no no mass factors, no mass or momentum factors. The just the argument is the same as I used up there. The that loop is some energy factors in the numerator and k squared downstairs. There's no left over. It's a scaleless integral in dimensional regularization. Scaleless integrals all have to vanish um, because they're in some dimension d, they're finite. And when they're finite, they have to be zero because there's no factor around to carry the dimensions. OK, OK, thank you. OK, so one throws out all these. Th these are so-called tadpole diagrams. These are bubble diagrams. For massless tadpoles, they vanish. Okay, I'll come back. I'm about to do that for massive particles. Um, good, we're fine. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing now for massive particles where they don't vanish, so we get to see them a little bit again. So, if you thank you, if it looks looks funny, we'll come back to it here. Okay, any other questions before I move on? Well, let's just continue then in case we'll postpone everything for the end of the lecture. So. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, I, I do use these these concepts again later on as we start doing the effective field theory. Okay, so let's do a loop with a massive field. Um, this will get us some other pieces. So now this guy looks like similar thing, but there's a eta mu nu p dot p prime minus m squared. So there's a mass factor sitting in the numerator, and then the, the propagator itself goes like 1 over k squared minus m squared. Okay. So now, now that tadpole is not equal to zero. Um, you can there's a cap over two sitting in front here. You get you know that this is then proportional to kappa. Um, and it goes like Actually, it goes like m to the fourth. Um, because this vertex goes like k, k, and the propagator goes like one over k squared, so that they cancel. The leftover momentum integral goes like m to the fourth. Um, 
likewise so other things also don't happen so now matrix elements like this mu nu alpha beta uh like i had before would have kappa over two there'd be a oh, sitting over here with this thing that i showed you before alpha beta q to the fourth There will also be terms that go like some other tensor, q squared, m squared, and another tensor here. m to the fourth. So now, what what do these things look like? Okay, so this is one we've interpreted that already. In fact, that's unchanged, basically. The, the mass is irrelevant for that piece or can be taken to be small. Um, this is something that looks like it has two powers of momentum. So, so this is like the curvature. Okay, so it's got two graviton fields and two derivatives it looks like the curvature. This one looks like curvature squareds. And this one here has no, no derivatives. So this looks like the cosmological constant. So when you do a massive field, you're going to get renormalization of the cosmological constant, the Einstein term, and also these curvature squared terms. So let's... The... Mo the Einstein one, well, there's something to be said there, but I'm probably not going to get to it. No. Um, but let's look at the renormalization of lambda. And so the renormalization of lambda are traced by looking at the m to the fourth terms, terms with no derivatives. The Cosmological constant enters in the action as square root of g lambda. So that's just a constant times square root of g. And so if I expand that, I get 1 plus 1 half h lambda lambda plus 1 eighth h lambda lambda squared minus a quarter h sigma lambda plus dot dot dot. The terms linear in the field quadra and quadratic in the field. So in some sense, we, we can see what we would then need to do if we if we're interested in terms linear in the field, we would look at a diagram that looks like that. So linear in the field. We would calculate this diagram. And okay, so this is a tadpole diagram. And the matrix element here is well. integral d d k over two pi to the fourth. It's things like k mu, k nu over k squared. Um, there's no k squared minus m squared. There's no momentum factors around. So k, k mu, k nu turns into eta mu nu. And but this integral no longer vanishes. It turns out, let's, let's, it turns into eta mu nu. It's m to the fourth, 64 i squared, one over epsilon minus log m squared over mu squared. And the fact there's a leftover factor I've calculated, so it's three halves. 
Okay. So there, there is some term linear, and it gives you something that looks like the term linear in the cosmological constant. Um, H lambda lambda is the trace of H. And so there's a divergent piece proportional m to the fourth. Quadratic in the field, it's, we, we need to do this guy and this guy. Now, this other term, this term doesn't vanish. Um, if I do this, if I do it at q is equal to zero, I get, um, I get the, the same effect as It's m to the fourth over 128 pi squared. H mu nu, H mu nu minus one half H squared. One over epsilon minus log m squared over mu squared plus three halves. You get the same, exactly the same factor out, which is great. And if you continue, you would get the same factors again later. This this is then a renormalization then the the equivalent feature is it's like delta square root of g lambda, renormalization of lambda. which is this factor m to the fourth um, 32 pi squared one over epsilon minus log m squared over mu squared plus three halves. And then the, the factors are one half h lambda lambda plus this one eighth h lambda lambda squared minus one fourth h mu nu h mu nu. So the structure comes out correctly, covari it's covariant. And we've renormalized the cosmological constant. Okay, so this is Renormalization of the cosmological constant. It's proportional to m to the fourth. And this is, in some sense, part of the cosmological constant problem. This is true for any massive particle, whether it's the electron or the top quark, the W boson, they all give proportional effects, proportional to m to the fourth. Those are all very much larger than the, the final result, which the cosmological constant is very small. Nevertheless, we're able to renormalize it using this technique. Okay, any questions here? Not about this part, because there are a couple of well, previous questions, but it's better to wait until the end. Okay, like then I'll, I'll carry on. Um, the thing I'd like to emphasize at this stage is that this is not a running, this does not produce a running value of the cosmological constant.
Okay. And what you can see when you look at this is some reasons why some people might think that it is a running parameter. Normally, when we're doing gauge series, we you often calculate the running uh, the beta function by taking mu d by d mu of of the renormalization constant. And I'd like to explain why that's really not the the correct thing to be doing here. Re real running is is a variation with the energy. Okay, and real running, when you um, see it in running, running reactions in gauge theories, it's, it's log Q squared that is running. This is this is the, the real running. When you have mass independent schemes, dependent on the flat. Mass independent schemes, you'll get when you do renormalizations, you get one over epsilon minus log. Q squared over mu squared in the renormalization. So tra if in these schemes, tracking mu squared reveals how it really depends on log Q squared. By knowing how it depends on mu squared, you know how it depends on Q squared just by dimensional analysis. And so when you're doing gauge series and you do a mass independent renormalization scheme, tracking mu squared is perfectly fine. But here, For lambda, the the constant is one over epsilon minus log m squared over mu squared. This does not depend on any momentum. Okay, and so when you renormalize it, one over epsilon disappears, log mu disappears, log m squared disappears, they all disappear. And there's no residual factors of, of energy and momentum. So up he, uh, here, if you, in the mass independent schemes, the log mu squared, then one over epsilon disappear, but you still have the log Q squared. Here, there's nothing left over. Everything disappears. So the first calculation we did with the log box and the log Q squared, these would be running parameters because they have the log of the kinematic variables left over. Here for lambda, it's not left over. 
Um, this the same end, ends up being true for delta G, G, which is gotten from the M squared, Q squared terms in the Lagrangian. There is no running of the, of that parameter. G does not run. Okay, the first, and then also you can sort of see it from the construction that I we did up here with the log box. If you have R log box R, that log box is a kinematic variable. You can't have lambda log box lambda log box acting on lambda doesn't mean anything. And likewise, you can't split up a single factor of R. You need two factors of R to, to get the non-local actions. That's probably that last part is a little probably a little too quick to be clearly understandable, but um, but these are these are important pieces that we get here. Um, let me just do a little sociology. So there certainly are many claims for running lambdas. Those those claims if have to be reinterpreted in some ways. They're they're not for physical amplitudes. So if you use G or lambda in a physical process, those guys don't run. The, it is possible to imagine them running in some abstract theory space. So a particular case that often happens is if you use a cutoff, then delta lambda is some number times the cutoff and off also called lambda to the fourth power over here lambda and so you if you're including or excluding effects above and below some cutoff the residual parameter can can be running but in practice that doesn't lead to a running of physical processes the the physics is independent of cutoffs and so these parameters don't run Um, let me just close with one just preview. The, the preview is what happens if I did gravity loops. I'll, I'll of course, talk about this more in the future, but they're very much similar to the massless fields in loops there. The coupling goes like the energy squared. The loops have the same structure. This was done by both development. And it's the same as the structure for the massless scalar field that I gave you. The Lagrange in this case goes like, the divergences go like one over epsilon, one over 120 
r squared, which is the same number that we got for a scalar, 7 over um, 20 r mu nu r mu nu. And I guess I've forgotten my 1 over 16 pi squared. There we go. So gravity is going to look very similar to the calculations I just did. It won't generate the massive terms because there's, they're not there. But again, it will generate effects of order the curvature squared. And so our next task is going to be trying to understand how to deal with the, the R squared, the curvature squared effects using effective field theory. Next time I'm going to turn to effective field theory and um, show you in different contexts how you deal with these effects and you still end up yielding predictable uh, results. And the hint is that it's like those log boxes that we saw earlier, the log Q squareds. The log Q squareds are, are part of the predictions. The divergences are perhaps not so much. Okay, so I've hit hit my timing uh, end right there. And so let me stop, take a few questions, and then we'll continue on Wednesday. <clears throat> All right. So there were a couple of questions left in the chat. One of that is um, always related to the gravity gauge square method. I guess, because it says, is there a way to obtain the einstein hilbert action from the corresponding gauge theory action in the double coding? You know, there's some progress that have been made recently. Um, the answer is not quite yet. There's This clearly hints that there's some, some deeper understanding that we don't yet have that will someday tell us the, these connections between gravitons and gauge series. Um, and uh, there has been some recent progress, but the answer is we don't fully understand it yet. And, and you couldn't you couldn't just say gravity is the square of the gauge theory and write down the einstein helper action. This is property of on-shell amplitudes and not of off-shell amplitudes, for example. So uh, another question probably was related to your answer on the weinberg witten theorem. And you just said to expand a little bit the argument about Lorentz invariance, the thing that you mentioned there. Yeah. Um, right. So the one of the funny things that it, about photon fields, for example, is that if you do a, a Lorentz boost on them, um, that to get them into the, back into canonical form. So let's, let's let's imagine doing you take a, one of those polarization vectors that is relevant for going in the z direction. You take it, make a Lorentz boost on it to put it back into the form that you would expect you need also to do a gauge transformation. So it's, it's only by doing a Lorentz boost and a subsequent gauge transformation that, that you get back the Lorentz invariance of the theory. So the, the redundancy that, that's there in the, the, from the gauge invariance allows the amplitudes to be Lorentz invariant. But the field itself, just treated as a field without doing gauge transformations is not. Um, it's, and that's the peculiar piece of physics that goes into the weinberg witten um, theorem that if you're if you have a Lorentz invariant theory, they show that the various amplitudes. Uh, should satisfy Lorentz invariance where gauge theory amplitudes don't. Um, the I don't really have a preparation for showing that in detail. 
the place to read it is in Weinberg's volume one of his quantum field theory book is, is the only place I know it's discussed in, in, in detail. Weinberg volume one. You, can I, it was me that asked the question. So can I follow yeah, up? Sure, sure. Uh, but you're saying it's in the Weinberg book, the proof assuming Lorentz invariance. So he pre shows in there that the various amplitudes, very that the that the photon field um, to make Lorentz invariant amplitudes, you need to also supplement the Lorentz transformation with a gauge transformation. Oh, okay. That's that's the that's what's discussed in the book. So, but that goes in the weinberg witten theorem proof? That goes into the proof of the weinberg witten theorem, yes. Thank you. All right. So, uh, one last question then. And, okay, let's see. Which other fields are known to induce curvature terms in this perturbative framework? And also, are there any references on this? I'm sorry, what was the question? I missed the question. <clears throat> Yeah, the question is, uh, which other fields are known to induce curvature terms in this perturbative framework? And second uh, related question, uh, are there any references to this? So references So the, for the curvature squared terms, they all, all fields will induce curvature squared terms. Um, the, they come with different coefficients. So the ones that, the one I showed you was for, um, a minimally coupled scalar field. If you make a, a, a fermion field or a photon field, you get different answers. Graviton is the answer that I that you see on the screen right there. Um, but all all fields give curvature term, squared terms in, in the action. Um, the yeah, there's I'm sure there's lots of references. Like the probably the place I'd ask you to read it first is in my the EFPL lectures, which I which are on the webpage, which describe several places. Um, probably the place that's the easiest in a book format is the old book by Burrell and Davies. Um, they there's a lot of material in there. Um, Burrell and Davies' is quantum fields in curved space-time. Um, since this is a property of the, the fields themselves of matter fields, it's, it's contained in that book. Um, okay. All right. So, yeah. It seems that there's no other question. I guess that we can end this first lecture here, the second part of your course. And okay. yeah, we. Very good. The next time is effective field theory time. Yeah. Um, All right. So it'll be this Wednesday then. This, this Wednesday, two days from now, effective field theory. All right. Great. Okay. Thank Very you. Good. We'll see you then. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.